Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back to the Fading Memories podcast. I'm your host, Jen Fink. Today, we are discussing something of the utmost importance to me, and I hope it would be also to you. I have Dr. Heather Sanderson with me, and we are talking about her book and her her research and clinical experiences on reversing Alzheimer's. So thanks for joining me. I'm just going to call you Heather because it's early and it's... <laughs> It's a Monday. I don't want to butcher every every word that comes out of my mouth. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Jen. Thank you. So I know that you you either worked with or studied with Dr. Bredesen. I've read his book, but why don't you give the listeners your background? That way I don't maul it, maul it to death. <laughs> I feel really privileged. I continue to work and be mentored by, work with and be mentored by Dr. Dale Bredesen. Um, we're currently collaborating at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute in um, Santa Monica in LA here in California. And so that's been, it's such a privilege. I originally trained. He had no idea who I was. I was fresh out of school and I saw him speak at a mental health an integrative mental health conference. And I was really intrigued by what he was saying, because in my training as a naturopath, I'd been told never suggest that you can support someone with Alzheimer's in any way. It, they're on their way downhill. There's nothing that can be done. And this is an irreversible disease process. And to suggest that you could help would be to give people false hope and to do harm. And I think that we are at a place where we can say, actually suggesting there's nothing that can be done is to engender false hopelessness. And this is one of Dr. somebody in Dr. Bredesen's um, network has suggested this. And I, I love that term, right? False hopelessness. The harm is actually in telling people there's nothing that can be done at this stage. It's factually inaccurate to say that there's nothing. We have seen this over and over again. I am not the only doctor. I'm not the only one that studied it and published it. We can jump into the research. But my story is essentially, I heard there was nothing you could do. Then I heard Dr. Bredesen suggest that there was something you could do. And I was intrigued because he basically was stacking all of the naturopathic interventions of detox and nutritional support and dietary changes and exercise and sleep management and stress management and getting rid of the infections and kind of this common sense comprehensive approach to supporting healthy living generally. And he was finding that it was working to support people with Alzheimer's. And I was intrigued enough that I went from just hearing his talk to then doing his training. And once I had done his training, I had people showing up in my office and we got to see them reverse their Alzheimer's disease. Now, I will say it's not guaranteed. It doesn't work for everyone. This is not an approach for everyone. It requires a lot of hard work. It requires often a care partner who is completely in alignment, who's willing to spend the time and money and the resources that it requires to change diet, to change exercise habits, to optimize sleep and to optimize the environment and to take some supplements and some medications and do the testing. There's a lot that goes into this. If there were a pill, if they were an IV, if it were that simple, I would be shouting it from the rooftops. I've seen so much suffering associated with disease. I know you've experienced it yourself personally. And I've also had the privilege of seeing people get better. Now, not always 100% better, but better to where it improves the quality of their life. It, they have more independence. They get back that, that connection, that experience of being, you know, experiencing Christmas or a birthday or an anniversary or a summer. And th this is, I mean, when I talk to patients, uh, I interface with so many people who are older and when we ask it, like, what's your favorite memory? What, what do you, you know, what are your regrets? What are your happiest moments? It's the connections. It's the relationships that matter most. And when we have the ability to be present in a conversation, to reminisce together, to look forward to something together, to celebrate together, that's really ultimately, I think, what life is about. And when we can maintain that a little longer or get it back, hopefully, that is what we're trying to do with this, this approach, Dr. Bredesen's work. So after being trained with him, seeing patients, I then had the opportunity to do a clinical trial. We also had the opportunity to open uh, Marama, which is a, the immersive residential experience. And through that, then people were like, well, I don't want to send my loved one to, to San Diego. I'm in England or in Australia. 
how do I do this here? So then we got to the opportunity to do this online coaching program, which um, we used to call Maram at Home. We're now calling it the Reversing Alzheimer's at Home program. And the book, the book is basically that coaching program put into a, a, a book. We have a workbook that goes with it. And then we're now using this as sort of the textbook to teach these coaching classes from. So that has been, I've, I've had the opportunity and the privilege of watching people improve in a clinical setting, in a residential setting, and then in a coaching setting, and then also in the research. In the research. So that has been really fun. It does not require me. It is like, I am not the magic in this. It is the care partner and the patient who are willing to do the work. It's really, really fun and so fulfilling to watch. Would be I would rather do that caregiving, that intense caregiving, versus the kind of caregiving you have to do when they get to the later end stages. Right. You know, you know it's you're saying it's a lot of work, but so is caregiving. And so if I had to choose, I would definitely choose this. Um, I think it's interesting that now that we have a couple of so you know treatments with another one potentially on the way that we're we're kind of like snapping back to oh you really know what works better i just find that fascinating because of course my news push notifications like i can't i can't get away from this topic no matter where i'm at but i saw um that segment that dr sanjay gupta did huh. on cnn with yep. the lady who five years later was convinced and probably she wasn't wrong because she would know her own self that she was actually better having done i'm assuming a lot of these things i don't know if she used yeah. um dr bredesen's no it protocol? was actually um, dean ornish and um and richard isaacson's patients so yeah what you're speaking to is that sanjay gupta did a docuseries on cnn and covered a, a, a few patients with um alzheimer's or cognitive decline and that was sort of in the lead up to um, this paper being published by Dr. Dean Ornish's group. And it's called The Effects of Intensive Lifestyle Changes on the Progression of Mild Cognitive Impairment or Early Dementia Due to Alzheimer's Disease, a Randomized con Controlled Clinical Trial. So this just came out in um, June of 2024. And the conclusions that they drew are so exciting. Now, this is the first randomized controlled trial. And it, they say a comprehensive lifestyle change may significantly improve cognition and function after just five months in many patients with MCI or mild cognitive impairment or early dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, significantly improve cognition. Now, this is incredible. And this is, and so this is a lifestyle intervention that includes a vegan diet. And so we can talk a little bit about the differences maybe between the research that I've done, Dr. Bredesen and his group have done, and then what Dr. Ornish did. So, and we, we're not comparing these apples to apples, right? So what we've seen, randomized control trial that Dr. Ornish did, lifestyle intervention. So not a ton of the precision-based functional medicine that Dr. Bredesen and I do, but an intensive lifestyle intervention that included stress management, sleep, a diet, a, a vegan diet, exercise, and um, a group, uh, basically a support group, other people meeting with other people who are in a similar experience. And that showed improvement. Now, we don't know how much improvement. But we see that there's an improvement compared to the control. So there's an, what we can draw, the conclusion we can draw there is that the intervention had an impact, right? Now compare that to Dr. Bredesen's trial. This was uh, published, Kat Toops was the primary author, Journal of Alzheimer's Disease in, in 2022. They published a, a paper that included 25 participants that went through a nine-month intervention now, I know many of your listeners are probably familiar with the MOCA test or the Montreal mm -hmm. Cognitive Assessment. So perfect score, just to remind everybody, perfect score is 30, normal score is 26 and above. They took participants down to a MOCA score of 19. So they uh, everybody had some sort of cognitive impairment, but they weren't that progressed, right? Still definitely in this mild cognitive impairment stage. And they gave them nine months of this intervention. So it included all the lifestyle pieces, a mildly ketogenic diet. And then they also did all of the, the um, lab testing, the detox, the, you know, they treated infections. They did all that as well from a functional medicine perspective. 
And they saw that 84% of their participants improved. And they, so that was, instead of having a control group, what they did was they compared it to baseline. Baseline to nine months later, 84% of their 25 participants improved. And what they see is about an average of a three point improvement in MOCA scores over the course of about 12 months. If people went without treatment, we would expect a three point decline each 12, every or two to three points over 12 months. So that was Dr. Reddison's study in, er, and cat tubes in 2022. And then in 2023, we published our trial, very similar. We did the precision medicine, functional medicine approach, testing all the things. And then we also did the lifestyle intervention, but we took participants who were more progressed. So they had MOCA scores of 12 to 23. And we also did the intervention more quickly in six months instead of nine months. And we saw that 74% of our participants improved. So again, there was no control group. We just compared baseline to six months later, how many of our participants improved. And we saw that 17 of the 23 did. We also saw that we had statistically significant improvements across the mean scores of all participants in overall composite cognition, MOCA scores, and memory specifically. We also saw improvements in sleep and quality of life scores. And we saw improvements on all of the cognitive parameters that we measured. Not all of them were statistically significant. So then now we have Dr. Ornish's trial, which is only five months long, and it's a control group versus the intervention group. And we're seeing that there's a, a big difference in improvement. Basically, you're getting improvements in the control group rather than going downhill. Now, so those are three trials. So nobody can say that there's no evidence, right? There's three published trials showing improvements with these lifestyle interventions. Now, I think some people go, well, what about these new medications? Aren't the medications helpful? The medications do not support any improvement in cognition. What they do is they, they delay the rate of progression. So basically you're progressing downhill, but you're going slower. You're drawing out a torturous process. Unless you manage to die first. Right. <laughs> I've had I've had people ask me, well, what do you think? And it's like, it sort of depends. And my answer is, how old is your loved one? Mm -hmm. uh, my mom had early onset Alzheimer's, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure the medication, well, if, he'd, if she'd started early enough, maybe it would have been better. But she was like 53 when I, when, when you know, looking backwards, wow. you could be like, oh, yeah, that was probably a sign. And you know, so if it only improves, you know, gives you like a more an extra year, I'm not sure how much that would have benefited her over significantly changing how she and my dad ate because many of my listeners will know that my dad was the worst eater. So my parents ate all the wrong stuff, <laughs> like Wonder Bread, American cheese, lots of beef. Um, my mom drank two liters of Diet Coke every day um lots of my mom is an absolute sugar fiend that is a genetic thing that i have had to fight for multiple reasons brain health avoiding diabetes avoiding alzheimer's <laughs> like me and the sugar beast have a battle every day but i'm not gonna let cravings mess up my brain so and i don't eat any of that garbage i don't drink sodas i don't eat american cheese i don't <laughs> really eat beef good choice um, the older I get, the less meat I want. And I've in, let's see. So December of 23, I started eating a lot more vegetarian. Um, I had been told by a previous ear, nose and throat doctor that I had silent reflux. And the reason I was having issues with my voice was because of that. And after, you know, three months, it didn't get better. <laughs> I did all the things and it didn't get better. So apparently I don't know how to talk plus allergies, plus possibly silent reflux. So, you know, I don't do anything the easy way. Um, but changing my diet, it's like I I never felt bad before because it was really lean and healthy, but switching it up, it's just like I felt different. Like I felt full and satisfied without that full, full feeling. It was weird. It's very hard to describe, but I'm like easing all the way into vegetarian 100%. <laughs> Yeah, what we see is probably because the Ornish paper was a vegan diet, so plant-based diet. 
And then what I think we'll probably see if I had to predict like what's the best brain health, healthy diet is probably going back and forth between ketosis and a vegetarian or, or plant-based diet. I think metabolically getting into ketosis is very healing for the brain. We have a lot of evidence that that's the case. But when we think about ancestral diets, which there's kind of a trend around that, right? Corn carnivore, paleo, keto, all of, all of these are basically mimicking the diets of our ancestors, not three generations back, but like a hundred generations back, right? What did cavemen kind of eat? And what we, we want to remember that like the consistent thing about an ancestral diet was inconsistency. You couldn't get blueberries 365 days a year. So you would be, sometimes there would be fasting days because there wasn't food available. Sometimes there would be an abundance of food. Sometimes there would be meat, but nothing else. And so I think that kind of fluctuating our diet, not having the same diet. I worry about people who eat the same, even if what they're eating is broccoli. I had a patient who ended up with a thallium uh, toxicity because he was eating only beef and broccoli all day, every day. That was the only thing he talked tolerated, but it ended up causing problems. It, it ended up causing a toxicity. And so variety helps us to avoid nutrient deficiencies and avoid toxicity. And um, I, I love the metabolic state of ketosis is very healing for the brain because many brains, as we age, regardless of our diabetes status, we're not as efficient at turning sugar into fuel or ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate is that fuel, that currency that our cells run on in the brain. We're not as good at that as we age. And so when we can change the fuel source from sugar into ketones, we essentially get more fuel. We're much more efficient at turning that into fuel. And we don't have as much oxidative stress. It supports detoxification. It supports reducing inflammation. There's a ton that it supports. And so um, getting ketones to the brain, whether it's through taking exogenous ketones like powders or pills, or if it or taking MCT oil or coconut oil even, or through carb restriction, that tends to be beneficial for a lot of people. I love it that you said variety is really important because I I know a lot of people that have like the same breakfast every day. It might be oatmeal, might be eggs, doesn't really matter. Um, they have kind of the same lunch for weeks on end until they change that up because it's easy and they don't have to think about it. And I'm I'm like, how hard? Well, okay, I work from home, so this this is a little easier. But it's like I don't eat the same breakfast every day pretty much don't eat, you know, if there's seven days a week, I probably have at least five different breakfasts and lunches. Lunch has a tendency to be leftovers or one of two sandwiches. So it's, it's simple, but it's like, I would literally go nuts if I ate the same thing for breakfast and the same thing for lunch. And if my dinner wasn't very, wasn't varied, no. <laughs> There's no, with you. There's I get bored. no point of living with that kind of meal. <laughs> so, I, I can't agree more. I get bored. And so I, we encourage a lot of that, mix it up, but keep it simple so that it feels doable. I discovered, so I, we moved like two and a half years ago and this past winter, it was like the pantry needs like a reorganization refresh because life changes right i'm eating different things it just needed a little shuffling not a huge you know undertaking and i'm like you know it's really annoying when you make like lentil soup and then you got these lentils left over like what can you do with lentils i discovered this recipe that i absolutely love it's um mexican rice beans cheesy mexican it's basically brown rice lentils black beans a little bit of cheese and some spices holy mackerel does that taste fantastic? I've made it a lot and now, you know, we're recording at the end of June here and it's hotter than Hades outside. <laughs> so I'm not terribly f interested in, you know, something that's that it's, that's a real comfort food. It was great during the winter, but it's like, it's super easy. Sounds like a lot of fiber, really good fiber, but will raise your blood sugar. Yeah. I, my blood sugar, cause I, I take, um, hormone replacement therapy cause I'm 57. And I used to get 48 hour monthly hormonal migraines. And it got to the point two years ago where the migraine was so bad, I literally couldn't complete a thought or even speak normally. It was like my brain was hitting the pain and I couldn't finish sentences. I, it was just, I'm like, that's it. Like, 
I'm done. <laughs> My mom tried HRT, but she did it through her GP and it was a disaster. So I was very reluctant. Haven't had a hormonal migraine since. So. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. We're yeah. fans of bioidentical hormone replacement for cognition. Yeah. It's, this is like, you know, significant blood test annually. It just, you had to do it quarterly the first year, then twice a year. Now I'm like annually. We'll see what the new health provider says about it. Cause I was going through a private clinic, private pay. Cause my old health provider was like hormones. Oh my God, we don't do anything with those. I'm like, that's like the whole, your whole system. That's like, that's the whole thing right there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that leads me into my question is why is this, I'm assuming that it doesn't sound like there's been a ton of research. I'm kind of wondering like, why are they not paying more attention to this? Like the general medical profession, if they could, they want an answer to, oh my God, what can we do? For Alzheimer's? Yeah. Or any kind of dementia? Yeah. So, well, I mean, billions of dollars have been spent and allocated by the National Institutes of Aging and, and by the federal government. And so how did we get it wrong? Maybe is more the question because it's, it, you know, there's a lot of people paying attention. Bill Gates has a huge foundation um, geared towards this there and he's partnered with others. Um, but there, there is a massive amount of attention being pay, paid towards Alzheimer's because so many people are aging right now with the baby boomers aging. This will bankrupt Medicare if it goes at the rate that it's going. And so there's sort of a desperation to find solutions. And in that, um, the, so many research dollars have been spent. But unfortunately, that has been directed at, at the beta amyloid plaque hypothesis. And although amyloid plaques are related to Alzheimer's, absolutely, I would argue that they're not causal. What we know about amyloid and misfolded proteins is that they exist in everyone. There's less than 2% of the population, whether you're talking about babies or centenarians, when you take the entire global population, less than 2% of people don't have amyloid. So we all have amyloid. And then there are people at the end of their lives uh, who are older, who have cognitive decline that don't have any amyloid, who might've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's in the past, but it's not an amyloid related Alzheimer's. There are lots of types of dementias and we can go into to the uh, nomenclature there and what, what they're called and, and why, but there are the amyloid piece. There are people with lots of amyloid who have good cognition. So it's not directly related. Like it's not, if you have amyloid, you have Alzheimer's, or if you have Alzheimer's, you have amyloid, or if you have memory loss, you have amyloid. And then the, although we're with the testing that we're better able to link that for a long time, you had to wait until autopsy. And so people would have a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's that was actually maybe a different form of dementia. But this, this relationship between amyloid and memory loss, I think, is where there's a little bit of breakdown, because partly because of the way that the research, like for a long time, there was a refrain in the research space that said, if you're not studying amyloid, you're not studying Alzheimer's. And yet we know, we've seen in the literature, that infections can drive cognitive decline, that toxins can co uh, drive cognitive decline, that traumatic brain injuries can be a cause of a cognitive decline, that genetics can be part of the one of the factors. And I think what's becoming more and more clear right, is that you might have one of these things, you might have several of these things, they're not mutually exclusive. And so how do we identify for each person what it is? And this doesn't fit that model, right, of a one molecule intervention that can be patented, that the drug companies can find and figure out and they can patent and market and keep people on for a long time so that it makes sense from the financial incentive perspective that that, that model doesn't fit the complexity of this disease process, that a simple single molecule intervention is, it doesn't work. We've tried, they have tried, they have put countless hours of smart people's time and billions of dollars into this and we are coming up short. And so what does work? A complex system science approach, a precision medicine intervention, looking at the individual and seeing what their risk factors are. This is well documented. The Lancet, a, a very reputable journal out of the UK, they wrote a commission report first in 2017 and again in 2020 when they updated it. And they suggest that 40% of worldwide dementias can be uh, prevented. And I think that that number is much higher. And they list 12 modifiable risk factors, plus they include sleep in there and a long discussion about sleep. But this is 
one of those things where like we see it, we know, we know that there are things that we can do to affect the outcomes. If we have just predisposition, whether it's because we're female or when we were born or because of our APOE status, we know that there are things that we do have control over. And I think the message hasn't been that. The message has been that the scary amyloid causes Alzheimer's. And when we are able to get rid of it with a miracle drug, Alzheimer's won't happen anymore. And that's just not the case. We know how to get rid of it. It doesn't make the cognition better. And so what we need to do is we th- need to think of the brain, like the way Dr. Bredesen describes it, as my brain is done, a country. Your brain is a country. Now, if we take our country and we're at war, if we're attacking and defending, we're not able to build roads and schools, right? We're, we're, we're not building the neurons and the synapses, the connection between those neurons, which is going to help with cognition. If we're stuck in that fight, flight, freeze mode, if we're stuck in attack and defend mode, we don't have the capacity to regenerate and heal and, and basically remember our neighbor's name, right? <laughs> we think, do I remember my neighbors? Yeah, I remember my neighbor's names. <laughs> Someone walked by this weekend and I was like, who is that? And my husband had to tell me. I used to be a wedding photographer and I absolutely hated going to the grocery store and there would be some random woman be like, oh, hi. I'd be like, who are you? Like my, like my poor brain would be like, um, and who are you? And it was always like the mother of the bride. And it was like, I was easy to recognize because day to day I looked pretty much the same, but at the grocery store, mom of the bride did not look the same as she did on the wedding day. It drove me bananas because <laughs> I'm super visual. And it's like, I, I, I can, I remember people when they're in the same place, but when you remove them and put them in a different place, it's like, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> it's quite wild. And I've tried all the techniques. It's just the way it is. But yeah, I, I have said a lot on this show and in, to people I know that I don't think modern life is very healthy for our brains. I I couldn't agree more, right? We're constantly distracted. Um, We're also like anxiety and depression. Um, So like if we just take those modifiable risk factors, right? Social isolation, depression, anxiety, these are our risk factors for dementia. And I think that with social media, with scrolling, with comparison, right, with our busy lives, uh, we feel more and more isolated, even though there's more opportunities for maybe online connection, we can feel more and more isolated. Also, uh, pollution is a risk factor for Alzheimer's and industrialization has led to more pollution over time. Plastics, but also exhaust, the petrochemicals, the phthalates, the PCBs, uh, the the, um, glyphosate and and Roundup, these chemicals that we're exposed to, mercury that's in fish more, these things all are neurochemical, like neurotoxic chemicals, and they can increase our risk of developing dementia. So there's... um, I, I, I sitting, right? We sit more. We don't sleep as much as maybe our ancestors did, our grandparents even did. The artificial light, the blue light, we're so in front of screens so much. I mean, this the list can go on and on and on. The highly processed foods is a big, big contributor to all complex chronic disease, all chronic disease. So there, there are many considerations here about, yeah, there are things that have gotten better. We can fly around the world and you know, be in another country tomorrow and experiencing the delights of the world. But we also, it it comes at a cost. Technology has, and, and the, you know, the evolution or the progress if, um, of our times, it doesn't, it's not all of it is beneficial for our health. Yeah, I, I just, I don't, who was I talking to? It's a past guest. So whatever episode it was on before this one, that you can get too much sleep, which I was like, oh, I did not know that. I thought that was interesting, but I get about just the right amount of sleep. It's very dark where I live. We don't have street lights. Right. Uh, my biggest issue is, and it's not every month, but we have a skylight in the master bathroom. And when the full moon is shining, sometimes it shines right through that skylight and it's like somebody left the light on the bathroom. <laughs> it's very annoying. <laughs> but other than that, it's dark, it's cool, it's just crazy and i exercise every day like i said i do everything since i have the three generations behind me with some form of dementia it's like oh yeah no we're we're not going there you know your apoe status no i should probably do that that would be insightful my 
maternal grandmother had a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months. So that is definitely not a good thing. They kept trying to tell her it was just a headache. My grandmother, who never had headaches. I would like to live that life. I get headaches all the time. But at least I don't get migraines anymore. <laughs> good and for then you. I don't, I don't know what kind of dementia my great-grandmother had because she died before I was born. So they probably didn't know. They just called it senile dementia back in those days. But um, how do we, so talk a little bit more about the ketogenics, because I'm not super familiar with that, so I'm sure the listeners aren't either, and that sounds like a place we should talk about so that people can, in addition to reading the book, maybe get a kind of a clue as to what that is so they can yeah, start thinking about it. If you go to drheathersandison.com, my last name is spelled S-A-N-D-I-S-O-N, drheathersandison.com, we have a free keto guide. It's like a nine-page guide that talks you through this in, in a succinct, actionable way. And essentially what we're doing is carb restriction. So you're trying to get all of most of the carbohydrates out of, out of your system so that you switch a metabolic, you basically flip a metabolic switch. So you move from burning fats or ketones. So you move for, into burning fats or ketones. Sorry. You're like, nobody's familiar with this. And then I start messing it up and I'm <laughs> making it really confusing. I'm going to make it really simple. Let me start over. So most of us burn sugar, carbohydrates, the, um, glucose. These are all kind of can be used interchangeably in a process called glycolysis. Most of us spend our entire lives burning sugar for fuel because unlike our ancestors, we have Skittles available 365 days a year, right? Like not that you're eating Skittles, but we have cereal for breakfast and a sandwich for lunch and pasta for dinner. We are getting a ton of sugar as not as, not as a candy bar, right? Not as a cookie or a cake, but as a processed carbohydrate, right? As grains. And so that turns, once it hits our gut, our gut doesn't care if it's a Milky Way or a rice. It's still sugar once it gets there. And then this raises our blood sugar and we turn that sugar when it goes into our cells, it uses insulin to get into our cells. And then it's turned into something called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is fuel. It's like currency that our cells repair, they heal, they divide, they conquer, they, you know, get rid of infections. They need fuel to do their jobs. And so if we are burning sugar for fuel our entire lives, we it develops some insulin resistance where insulin basically doesn't do the job of getting that sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cell as well. And we get a buildup of sugar in the bloodstream and also we can get builds up of insulin. And so this can be basically lead to almost like a caramelization of our cells. This is an irreversible process. So once this happens, like just as you would caramelize an onion, right? It becomes sugary kind of it that can happen to our cells and they don't work. They, they stop working. These are advanced glycated end products and it's ages, age, ages uh, is the acronym and it causes aging. This is associated with aging and it can cause a toxicity in the brain and neurodegeneration directly. So the alternative is to burn fat for fuel as ketones. So ketones, just like we use carbohydrates, sugar, glucose kind of interchangeably, we can use fats and ketones interchangeably. This becomes the new fuel source. Now, if our body has both sugar and fats arriving, this increases inflammation. What we want to do is reduce the carbohydrates or the sugar that have really good high quality fats coming into the system. And when we do that, we flip that metabolic switch and we start burning fat for fuel. This process takes about three days or 72 hours of carb restriction, carbohydrate restriction. So no beans, no lentils, no rice. Um, no bread, no pasta, no fruit. Now, I'm not saying that fruit is bad for you or fruit is not healthy, but fruit raises blood sugar. So it does not allow you to achieve metabolic ketosis, which is what we're looking for. Because when we get into ketosis, when we start burning fat for fuel, the lights turn on. It is wild. We see, I've had patients who go from not remembering their grandchildren's names to remembering all of their names. I, I mean, people just talk about like, it's like, I back. It's like I got my brain back. They remember words. They feel more articulate. They feel more present. They're instead of being on that sugar roller coaster of spikes and drops, these peaks and valleys, and that hangry feeling and that sugar carb feeling, you stop having cravings. You aren't you aren't controlled by like what am I going to eat next? 
you almost have to remind yourself to eat and get, and what we recommend is lots of nutrients, highly nutrient dense foods. And in the book, I have a meal plan for a month and 15 recipes that are all easy to make. They're not like what chef makes over at Marama. They're the simple, straightforward, easy to make meals that I make at home when I'm in ketosis. And for me personally, like what I get out of getting into ketosis, instead of struggling to get out of bed between six and 6.30, I am like up at five, ready to go, ready for my day. My mood is more stable. I'm more creative. I'm more patient. I, I just, I feel more articulate. Um, it's, there's a quality, I sleep better at night. There's a quality to life where like a lot of the junk goes away. Um, kind of like you described, right? It's like, there's this shift when I changed my diet, like I can't really put words to it, but I just feel better. Yeah, and I didn't so, feel bad before, but I yeah. feel different better, which I know that's great, great grammar We're there. Optimized. But that's a good term. I'll have to remember that one. Um, the one thing that I noticed, so many of my listeners also know this, so this, this is 2024, so 12 years ago, so actually, if we go back to 2006, I had a photography client who was also a doctor. Somehow we got on the topic of on my dad's side of the family, lots and lots of diabetes. Interestingly, all men, even though myself, so I'm the oldest of four granddaughters, Skip my sister, who's number two. So granddaughters one, three, and four, all seriously overweight. So I lost over 100 pounds. Wow. And it wasn't until I was about 95% there when my um, personal trainer and nutritionist said, just because it's whole wheat doesn't mean it's not a starchy carb. And I'm like, Okay, well, I've lost all this weight eating these things. And the one thing that I do, so I am part of a cycling club, bicycles, not motorcycles. There's no engine on my bike except for me. Right. And so I thought, well, let me speed up this process and cut out the starchy stuff. So one night I had, um, was basically um, beef and green beans. It was an Asian dish that I made at home. Went to do our normal 20 minute bike ride, 20 minute, 20 mile bike ride. 20 minutes is easy. Halfway through, I like literally hit a wall. My energy just just died off. And I thought that's really interesting. And when you look at like the Tour de France riders, bleh, I can speak today, I really can. That's pretty much all they eat is like rice. Their team buses have like giant rice cookers. So you, you think of carb loading and they're eating all this pasta, they're actually eating white rice which I always find very interesting. So it's, it's kind of interesting. I don't know. How would you know if you're having inflammation? Because I think that if you have that feeling or you know you've got the clues that you're having inflammation, yeah, so maybe, you should, all of our maybe you should switch. Used to get into ketosis. Now, I wouldn't recommend anybody be in ketosis for the rest of their life, but I think everybody should try it. So those Tour de France um, uh, bike riders, they also use exogenous ketones. So they will they will get sugar for fuel, but they will also use ketone esters at the same time. So they're looking for two types of fuel so that they can have plenty to be the engine on their bike. Yeah, they need it. <laughs> yeah, they need it. They've got a long way to go. So I really recommend, I think everyone should have the experience of getting into ketosis to see what it feels like because it, you're just, yeah, you're burning with a different type of fuel. And for many people, they will feel the experience of less inflammation, better sleep. It's detoxifying. You, you get more energy in your brain. Your, our brain makes up 2% of body weight, but uses 20% of energy expenditure every day. This is a huge amount of fuel that our brain needs. And we can get it there more efficiently, quicker. And also you get that freedom of not being hungry all the time, not searching for your next meal. So I think, and you also will get rid of those sugar cravings go away because changing our diet in this way, we kill off the bad bacteria and yeast in our gut that cause us. It's often, it's not us actually craving the sugar. It's the gut bugs that are saying, I need food, feed me. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting thing that I think the continuous glucose monitors can make it a lot easier to get into ketosis because we can start seeing what's happening with our blood sugar swings. Those are available. If you ask a provider, you're going to go see your new primary care provider. I'd be curious if they would uh, get you a, um, continuous glucose monitor. You can send these to Costco. And even if you don't have Costco membership, at least 
my understanding is that by law, they have you have to have access to the pharmacy. And using the GoodRx coupon, you can get the CGMs, the continuous glucose monitor for $63. They used to be like 400. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the most informative things you can do because you can watch what happens when I eat this meal, when I eat that meal, this is what my blood sugar does. But also when I get enough sleep, this is how my blood sugar responds. When I exercise, when I go on my 20 mile bike ride, this is how my blood sugar responds at the beginning. And then after 10 miles and then after 20 miles. And then after an hour, when I'm done, what's going on? And then also stress. Many people don't realize that cortisol an increase in cortisol will spike blood sugar. And so just seeing the dynamic, the variability, I love having people do it with their partner where you both wear a continuous glucose monitor. And then you see, oh, we had the same meal, but his blood sugar did this and my blood sugar did that. They're really different based on our individual biochemistry and and all um, and our metabolism. That's an interesting idea. And since I specifically picked a general physician that's a DO, which I cannot remember what the O stands for, but I know they're more of a natural medicine than an yeah, MD. Yeah, doctor of osteopathy. Osteopathy. Mm-hmm. See, I can't even say that. <laughs> just, um, that and then. Um, the ENT, I saw like a lot of the doctors that I've seen so far are all just, you know, they're not, they don't seem to be into quick fixes and, you know, yeah. like fixing stuff that doesn't necessarily need to be fixed. Cause I went to the dermatologist and one, one um, negative of losing weight besides stretched out skin is the tear ducts lost all the fat out of there. So, um, you know, sometimes I look in the mirror and I think, dang, I look like I'm really tired and I'm not. (laughs) And he he explained why any sort of anything was not a good idea. And I'm like, okay, great, because I'm not real, I'm not really into like the idea of any kind of plastic surgery, including for the stretched out skin, which is much more of an issue than than looking tired a lot. (laughs) So I really am excited that we have doctors that are more aligned with how we think or at least how i think so i might talk to him about the the glucose monitor because we have the you know my dad was diabetic his both his brothers are diabetic well one just passed away um so i told the last one we're standing i'm like hey dude uh you gotta you gotta hang around a while And and he this is my family he joked about he had to get to a certain age 82 i think it was to like break even on social security <laughs> it's like okay whatever that if that's your goal that's fine their mother my paternal grandmother lived to 103. wow so, um need to be I around cannot, for- yeah i cannot eat like her because she ate the same thing all the time and she i don't know how she ate enough calories to keep her going um because just whew, we lived with her for three months and it was an eye opener to observe what she did and didn't eat. <laughs> that was crazy. Um, is there, cause we're getting all getting to the end here. Is there, so obviously we all want to get, we all want to fuel our brains better. Is there a last bit of advice you want to give for people like me with a family history that we're also caregivers and maybe a suggestion as to why they should, go down this path with their loved one who may, cause I know in the book you talk about a, your first dementia patient and she was like mid stage, correct? This would be Darlene. The first woman. Yeah. Darlene, she had a MOCA score of two. So on a scale of oh, three, that's she light. Was very advanced. Yeah. She ha- could barely respond with yes or no answers to questions. And six weeks later, she had a MOCA of seven and she, had, she was speaking in full sentences, really inspiring case. Now, what what I've seen, what gives me the most confidence that someone is going to respond is they start early, right? Early on in the disease process. We don't wait till where Darlene was, right? Where yeah. both are too. We start, if you're genetically, if you're predisposed, you start in your 20s and 30s. You start early making decisions because we know that people with ApoE 4.4, so APOE status, so genetic predisposition, let's just chat about that real quickly. So 13% is, as, if you t- take the whole planet, 13% of us will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's at some point in our lives. If you have APOE 3-4, so one copy of the APOE 4, you get one from mom, one from dad, you, get, you can get a 2, 3, or a 4. If you have one copy of 4, your risk goes from 13% to 30%. Now, if you have ApoE 4-4, one from mom and one from dad, your risk goes up to well over 50%. You probably will get Alzheimer's. 
Now, we also know a ton about modifiable risk factors. So what we want to do is understand our genetics in our 20s so that we can start modifying those risk factors well before the onset of any disease change in our brain. We know that at symptom onset, symptom onset, so when we start noticing or our, our loved ones start noticing that we're not remembering the neighbor's name or we don't remember the dog's name or we don't remember that a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat. By the time we get to that stage, there have been changes in our brain going on for decades. So we want to make these changes early so that we can never progress to that stage of subjective cognitive impairment where we notice, but maybe it's not even being measured on a test yet. So there's four stages, that pre-symptomatic phase, the subjective cognitive impairment, the mild cognitive impairment, nothing mild about this. This is like where you have full-blown dementia. It is starting to change how you interact with people, how you socialize, what, of course, what you remember. You're starting to rely on other people for going to appointments, or maybe you're still driving, but maybe not. And then fourth is full-blown Alzheimer's. And we don't have to wait that long, right? The idea is to get involved in this whole lifestyle process earlier. And so what, one of the things that really helped Arlene, they dove in fully. So she wasn't young. She wasn't early on in her disease process. They were fully committed to getting on the program. And it was amazing. They did so well, but not everybody will. We have way more confidence if we can delay and prevent but we've shown that it's possible to delay and prevent by showing that it's possible to reverse. Yeah, going from a two to a seven is pretty, pretty big jump. Yeah, I mean, we have patients go from single digit MOCA scores to better regularly, but nowhere near as often as those improvements that we see when people are in like MOCA in the 20s still. So the prevailing opinion that the once the brain is damaged, it's that's it is not necessarily correct. No, they just don't not. know. Yeah, they just don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to keep up with all of the, all the, you know, um, uh, all the science. There's so much research. It's just constantly coming out. It's right. And there's AI, the technology, there's so much. And so not everyone will know. Everyone is trying to do a good job, right? All of the healthcare providers out there want you to be healthier. They want to support you. They didn't get into this to, you know, for you to get sick, right? right? They're there to support you, but they're stuck in a model often that doesn't help. Yeah, that's true. Well, this has been really good. I've talked to people in the past and we didn't have like the research out there as readily available as we have now. Mm -hmm. And so now we, now there's two books people should be reading, Dr. Bredesen's book and Heather's, Dr. Sanderson's book. And the book and the um, your website are linked in the show notes blah i'm praying <laughs> it's like it's warm and my air conditioner doesn't work so it's definitely making me sleepy <laughs> as soon as the weather went up 20 degrees in 24 hours my air conditioner said i'm not coming to play <laughs> oh and we see these extreme heat events definitely are hard on people with cognitive decline it makes it worse so stay cool fortunately my office in the winter is unbearably cold all the time i have a radiant heat mat under the desk that I like to put my socked feet on to thaw out my poor frozen feet. <laughs> Not having that problem today. <laughs> um, the opposite. It, it's just, I can't turn on the little fan because it blows on the mic, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how just being, a, even, and for me, this is, this, most people would be really uncomfortable, but I'm just like, just a little bit warm. I feel like taking a nap. <laughs> So it definitely does affect your brain, the heat. So we got to be careful in the heat. And I would assume that pretty cold weather is not great either because that makes you just want to sleep and eat bad things. <laughs> well, I appreciate this so much. This has been really interesting. I wish I had a mom still to work mm -hmm. to test it out on, but I remember the day that she got a zero on her mocha test. That was That was exciting. It's so hard. I thank you for putting the information out there and supporting others. I thank you for being a caregiver to her. It is hard work. And I'm so glad that you are taking your cognition seriously because we see that caregivers are anywhere from two and a half to six times more likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's later on. So you have genetics plus the stress of caregiving, the burden of caregiving can put us at risk. So thank you so much, Jen, for putting this out there, for doing what you do. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much. 
Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.